Good morning. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, for this very generous introduction. And I'd also like to thank um, all the organizers um, involved in this symposium in memory of François Brunet. So as you said, I defended my thesis under his supervision uh, last September, and this presentation is largely indebted to his late work. So a few years ago, while I was in the early stages of my research on photography in California around 1900, San Francisco was celebrating the centennial of the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915. The fair marked the end of urban reconstruction after the earthquake and fire of 1906 and witnessed a newly emerging art scene, including local photographers. Curator Jim Gans writes in the Centennial Catalog, in rapt attendance was the young San Franciscan Ansel Adams, whose 13th birthday coincided with the opening of the fair. His father, recognizing the exposition's educational potential, gave him a season's pass in lieu of school for the year. In an oral history from the 1970s, the legendary landscape photographer was asked about his experience of the exposition. In hindsight, he claims to have taken issue with the photographic offerings. In reference to the pictorial gallery, which he misremembered as containing works by members of the California Camera Club exclusively, he recalled, the Camera Club show was so dreadful, I looked at part of it and just left. In 1915, during Adams's visit, the California Camera Club was still a major venue for aspiring photographers uh, in the Bay Area. Founded in 1890, it consisted of professional and amateur photographers, more than 400 around the turn of the century. During this most active period, they held salons, monthly exhibitions, lectures, and outings, issued two journals, celebrated two universal expositions, and survived an earthquake. Even though its first generation was gradually disbanding around 1915, the club continued to serve as a stepping stone for aspiring photographers throughout the 1920s. Its library and printing rooms were frequented by Consuelo Canaga and Dorothea Lang. Edward Weston exhibited his platinum prints at the California Camera Club as early as 1917 and held joint exhibitions there into the 1920s. Ansel Adams himself became involved with the club at the time through long-standing member William Dassonville, who advised him on printing processes and had him use his charcoal black paper. Until as late as 1935, Adams participated in club events, notably annual dinners where he held entertaining speeches. So what had happened? Why this vehement rejection of his early network? If we want to situate Adams's memory as a 13-year-old recounted half a century later, we have to consider other statements made on the California Camera Club in the same period. In the 1960s, about the same time as Adams's interview, Adam, his longtime acquaintance, MoMA curator Bowman Newhall wrote, the West Coast camera clubs were only pale imitations of the camera club in New York, which under the dynamic influence of Alfred Stieglitz was the spearhead of amateur photography until the formation of the photo secession in 1902. To judge from the reproductions in Camera Craft, that is the club magazine, the photographs of the California pictorialists were weak imitations of the styles of the photo secession, lacking in taste, technique, and conviction. Both Newhall's and Adams' comments on the California Camera Club mark a selection process that was intensified by their collaborations in the 1930s and 40s. And today I'd like to highlight these developments between New York and San Francisco that resulted by 1940 in a history of American photography with a clearly defined set of individual practitioners separated from local collective networks. This history created a conspicuous gap for the decades around 1900, during which the California Camera Club and many other clubs were active. The gap would be filled and dominated, as we can see, by the select circle of the New York Photo Secession, which eventually erased histories of other camera clubs. Today, I'd like to retrace how this museum history was shaped on the East Coast, how it was received and applied to the West, and notably in California in the 1930s and 40s, and how scholars may question its legacy. To understand from which perspective Adams and Newhall wrote about the club, 
we need to first grasp the development of a dominant history of photography, which was explored by Francois over the past few years. He defined Bowman Newhall's history of photography from 1839 to the present day as probably the most influential source. It championed individual figures over networks, aesthetic ideas over social histories. As a result of the 1937 MoMA retrospective, Newhall's book account underwent five editions up until 1982. It was published at the same time as an historian from Kansas, Robert Taft, um, wrote Photography and the American Scene, and yet Newhall's history became a canon maker, whereas Taft's would rapidly fall into oblivion. By the 1960s, when Adams and Newhall wrote about the club, MoMA's model of photographic appreciation dominated major art museums and the art market. The Museum of Modern Art has subsequently been identified by scholar Abigail Solomon Godot as, I quote, the single most influential source of photographic legitimation in America. It embraced exhibition and collecting politics that focused on the autonomy of the aesthetic, the photograph as an isolated object, and on individual artists. Although criticized, these decisions have strongly influenced the popular perception of photography. To articulate a museum history meant to communicate co coherence and unity, to create a legible aesthetic with a handful of protagonists. <coughs> so how was the MoMA model transported to San Francisco in this period? It needs to be emphasized that when the New York art scene developed in the early 20th century, California was a remote place on the western edge of the continent. While some of its photographers sought contact with the East 5,000 kilometers away and mostly in vain, many others embraced a Californian style that celebrated the region's landscape and history. Physical isolation was deeply felt by locals and became a defining feature of Californian culture at large. So with this limited horizon, it took decades for art institutions to gain visibility. Museums like the Legion of Honor or the Oakland Art Gallery, built after the 1915 exposition, were considered underdogs, in the words of Paul Mills. They were underdogs in a period when even American art history was an underdog, and certainly California art history was. To create nationally meaningful collections, as MoMA had done, Californian institutions needed a coherent display. The works of photographers like Carlton Watkins or Timothy O'Sullivan in the 1870s and the contemporary styles of Ansel Adams and Edward Weston represented an attractive canon of male loners. And yet, how could the variety of camera club practices in between these two periods, so around 1900, be depicted? Those practices included, but were not limited to, pictorialism. Initially, pictorialism focused on the emulation of a painter, painterly style through matte prints and soft lenses and to show the camera's artistic potential. In 1915, when Adams visited the exposition as a teenager, the style was still widely embraced by photographers like club member Louis Stellman, who you see on the right, and Adams himself here on the left. Yet photographers of the period also cultivated a broad range of other interests. The California Camera Club, like many other clubs, was a vast network without a single leader interested in tourism, local history, or commercial work. Yet over the past decades, the work of camera clubs has been narrowed down to Alfred Stieglitz and the photo secession. Stieglitz's 291 gallery and his magazine camera work provided the perfect backdrop. The group was led by, by a vocal figure advocating in favor of photography as a fine art, and it underwent a stylistic evolution. By 1917, in the last issue of camera work, Stieglitz rejected pictorialism and moved towards straight photography, a style that relied on the inherent qualities of the camera, illustrated in a portfolio by Paul Strand. So the evolution from pictorialist to straight, from soft to sharp prints, from nostalgic to abstract motifs, became associated with a clear set of individuals, notably Stieglitz and Strand. Adams, in his early career, as we have seen, explored both styles. Yet in 1929, after meeting Paul Strand in New Mexico, he started to follow the straight label. He abandoned matte papers, like the one Dassonville had given him at the club, for glossy prints. The adoption of this new label was later qualified by Adam's biographer as nothing short of a conversion, a spiritual transformation. 
In San Francisco by 1932, amid the thriving camera club scene, Adams created his own secession. Along with Edward Weston, Imogen Cunningham, and others, Adams formed Group F64, which followed this straight aesthetic. Named after a small aperture setting that allows great depth of field, the group championed a sharp focus instead of soft tones. They met at a studio at 683 Brockhurst in Oakland, a three-ciphered label just like Stieglitz's 291. In a manifesto, they called for a revolution dedicated to, I quote, the limitations of the photographic medium. And even though scholars have shown that F64 overlapped with pictorialist styles which were popular until the 1940s and 50s, while F64 was very short-lived, the group's avant-garde image has persisted over time. In the spring of 1933, a year after the foundation of the group, Adams eventually met Stieglitz at his New York gallery in American Place. Historians of photography, including Adams's biographer, have characterized the encounter as momentous and life-changing, um, an old master meeting a new disciple. Regardless of this grandiose language, this was indeed the first time in two decades that a Californian photographer established a connection with Stieglitz. As Rachel Saylor has argued, Adams desired to, I quote, rarify his photography in a high art style, quote end, and he needed visibility. Under Stieglitz's strategic guidance, he became an advocate of fine art photography on the West Coast and sought to shed California's reputation as a cultural backwater. The following years, Adams's leadership took on more concrete forms in photographic criticism and curatorial work. After an exhibition at Stieglitz's gallery in 1936, Adams's work came to the attention of MoMA curator Bowman Newhall, who included him and F64 in his 1937 retrospective. By 1940, when MoMA established its Department of Photography, Adams was named vice chair to Newhall. In their first exhibition, 60 Photographs, a survey of camera aesthetics the same year, his work was shown next to Paul Strand. Interestingly, the exhibition also covered the 1900s, for which Stieglitz and other photo secessionists were selected. Yet, Adams also included a San Francisco photographer, Arnold Gente. Gente was an early member of the California Camera Club and had a portrait studio um, in San Francisco. He was also well known for his pictorialist work in the 1900s. His contacts with Stieglitz were, as for most Californians, very rare. And yet Adams depicted him as a West Coast equivalent to Stieglitz, an old master, a German-speaking intellectual, an art collector, without, of course, mentioning the club. To mark this continuity, Adams requested permission from Gente to reprint some of his earthquake views of 1906 on glossy paper with sharp contrast. These new prints completed the narrative of straight photography. The style could now be traced from Adams and Group F64 to Strand, Gente in 1900 all the way back to Timothy O'Sullivan in the 1870s. As Jacob Birken remarked, this reprinting stripped Gente's work off its pictorialist context and consciously adapted it to the new canon. At home, Adams applied similar strategies. In 1940, again, he became the advisor of the photo department at the San Francisco Museum of Art, which had opened five years earlier. In this function, he donated F64 prints to the collection, and he also insisted that the museum needed to distance itself from the amateur groups that were given exhibitions in the past, hence discarding any productions generated by the club or its popular local network. Finally, on the occasion of the Golden Gate International Exposition in 1940, Adams curated the pageant of photography show, at which he further solidified this narrative. In camera craft, he explained the absences of the exhibition. Space and time permitting, I would have designated a gallery to pictorial photography, another gallery to amateur work, and would have augmented the technical and advertising material to a considerable extent. Fortunately, an excellent exhibit of photography, mostly pictorial in character, is installed in the California building at the exposition, so this phase is not neglected at the fair. Unsurprisingly, the show in the California building, a pavilion that depicted industries, businesses, and tourist attractions, was hosted by the California Camera Club. 
25 years after his first visit to a San Francisco fair, Adams had eventually created two spaces, one for camera clubs and one for his own selection, emphasizing the notion again of two separate histories. The club itself, on the occasion of the fair, insisted both on its network of hobby photographers and on pictorialism, goals that again many camera clubs of the country ascribed to in 1940. This local mission had been promoted since its foundation 50 years earlier. In this regard, the year 1940 also marked the club's 50th anniversary. Journals like American Photography situated the club amid the oldest societies of the country next to the ones of Philadelphia and Boston. Among its most famous members, it listed Dassenville, Gente, but also local investors and photographers who are forgotten today. In the same period, the club made its first donation, as you can see here, a set of lantern slides of the Panama Pacific International Exposition was given to the San Francisco Public Library, an institution that reflected its local engagement. Since the city lacked museum spaces during the club's most productive period, it was impossible for members by 1940 to become part of Adams's cherry-picked selection. While the club was appreciated for its 50, years, its 50 year history and its activities in the Bay Area over two generations, it was exactly this communal character that dismissed it from the fine art canon that was in the making. The rejection of camera clubs was thus finalized by Adams by the 1940s. His anecdote of the exhibition told three decades later where he was so repelled by the display that he just left adds to this erasure. On the one hand, the description of the works as dreadful implied that their quality was so obviously inferior that even a 13-year-old would recognize it. And on the other hand, the misrepresentation of the show as Camera Club worked allowed for a sweeping dismissal of all club productions as Newhall would then also underline. In the 1940s then, through the strategic choices of Newhall, Adams and Stieglitz and their linear depiction of styles, a photographic tradition for the nation was invented. As Rachel Saylor and Anne McCauley have observed, the 1940s saw the emergence of a written rhetoric that linked contemporary practices to 19th century work. A genealogy, a heroic biography with a dominant style was thus created, one that was separated from more eclectic collective practices. During the second half of the 20th century, the underdog institutions of the West Coast, like the Legions, Legion of Honor or the Oakland Museum, would, would progressively adopt this new tradition. <laughs> In the long run, this resulted in the continuity from Watkins to Weston, the name of several, ex ex the title of several exhibitions also, which was a story of lone practitioners out west into which individuals of the turn of the century, like Gente, could be smoothly inserted. To finish, um, while this selection was certainly necessary in a period when photography occupied an unstable place in American art, Today, the gaps of this canon are striking. Groups like the California Camera Club, despite their substantial production over 50 years, are either entirely absent or exist merely in footnotes. If the years around 1940 mark the rise of Newhall's history, what also stands out is the omission of Robert Taft. Taft proposed a social history with a much broader and profoundly local understanding that we can use today. Over the last few years, scholars, and Francois, of course, included, have increasingly relied on his proposal, I quote, that local historians would find a fertile field of research in state and local historical societies, not only in locating material, but in preparing brief photographic histories of their localities. In my own research on the California Camera Club, the focus on these institutions that were left out has given me an extremely fertile terrain. Collections from the Bancroft Library Berkeley, the California Historical Society, or the public libraries of San Francisco and Los Angeles hold thousands of boxes with prints, albums, lantern slides, and correspondence. These move far beyond the restrained focus of scholarship inspired of the 1940s. The presence of this material across the American West tells us of photography's strong anchorage in Californian life and of its extremely diverse practices that moved far beyond pictorialism. The fact that most club members cannot be found in major institutions does not mean that they did not assemble archives of their own 
or that their work was not appreciated by contemporary audiences. Instead, this very absence forces us to turn our gaze elsewhere and to question fabricated continuities. I'd like to close with the words of Peter Palmquist, an early mentor and collaborator of uh, Francois, who suggested that in photohistorical research, the net must be cast wide. One cannot solely rely on assessments based on art historical methods, nor can one make a case based on a few major institutional collections. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating to see how uh, that history congealed already by 1940. Um, I'm wondering in your research um, whether or how firm that narrative was in the 1940s, because I, I think of the way in which um, you know the Museum of Modern Art mounted Road to Victory, which I know Ansel Adams hated that show. Um, but he was also being criticized quite a lot at that period in the 40s by Dorothea Lange. Um, and so I've had the sense that Adams felt challenged and attacked um, during the war especially. And in certain you know, you could argue he actually modified his approach in the 40s. His work became much more theatrical, um, and some of his most famous photographs actually date from the war. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, in your work, I'm just wondering how you have dealt with those kinds of challenges and, um, in the 40s, and it, is it really also then after the war that his narrative reclaims mm -hmm. front and center stage? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So what I saw in my research um, was that by the by the early 1940s, when or the late 1930s and the early 1940s, when we still have um, the magazine Camera Craft that I also talked about in the presentation, um, which was based in San Francisco, through that magazine you can basically follow the different discussions that were going on at the time. And Adams was um, criticized. Um, he was criticized by um, the network of San Franciscan photographers that he was a, um, a part of and that he had benefited from also in the 1920s and throughout the 1930s also. Um, but we, so we see this network that slowly distances itself from his um, occupations, if you will. And what I found striking is that he, by the early 1940s, already insert, becomes inserted into this continuity that is voluntarily shaped by, at MoMA and that he then really tries to um, transport to San Francisco and to apply it in San Francisco once the San Francisco Museum of Art um, uh, creates his, uh, his its department of photography, um, where he basically says, following up on these discussions in Camera Craft, that he did not want um, amateur groups pr present in those collections, and so I think he was he was really insisting on um, that rigorous implementation, if you will, of that of that narrative. Um, but what is interesting is that if, if you talk about the, if you look at the 1940s and his theatrical um, productions, the ones that he would become known for um, later on, what is interesting is that in the 1940s, or right after the Second World War, when tourism really set in and at Yosemite, he was very much engaged in um, documenting tourist attractions and publishing the Yosemite tourist calendar, um, basically work that many photographers of the California Camera Club had been doing for decades. And this is an aspect that is sort of constantly pushed aside this commercial work that he was doing with local investors with the tourism industry at Yosemite. And so um, I think he, he, he was criticized and he was criticizing um, the, the local photographer groups, but, but at the same time he was basically practicing the same style and had been practicing in the same ways for, um, for years, but he simply managed to shape his narrative differently later on. Yeah, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Um, I, as kind of a follow-up to Cecile's question, uh, you know, as 
the swing back towards Steichen and, and away from mm -hmm. the photograph as fine art is so pronounced mm -hmm. in 1947. Um, I guess my question is about Taft, though. I mean, how this major kind of historiographic division between what Alan Sekula would call social, social work versus mm -hmm. camera work, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how... How does Taft, I mean, is Taft, how, how is he justifying photography, if, if not as fine art? Um, is it primarily, it's a documentary history, it's a shift back towards an em, uh, emphasis on the documentary function of photography? Um, I mean, I, I'm also curious about something like, you know, how Matthew Brady and Timothy O'Sullivan enter into um, Beaumont, Newhall's account, because mm -hmm. they were documentarians um, with, obviously with their fine art elements in mm -hmm, O'Sullivan's mm -hmm. work, but not in a, any kind of conscious way, as we know from yeah. Rosalind Krauss's article. Yeah, so yes. yeah, so those yes. kinds of questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, that is an, that is an important question, and I'm, I'm not sure whether I really have the answer to that, but what I became aware of is this um, division between fine art and social history. I'm not sure whether I would, I mean, I tried to illustrate this process here today, but I'm not sure whether I would um, really stick to those two fixed categories. The, we see the two categories developing through Newhall and Taft, um, but what Taft really does in his work um, of, he, his book covers the period of 1839 to 1889, okay, so he doesn't even enter the 20th century, okay? But um, what I saw in Taft is really this um, recognition and the acknowledgement that photography is very much embedded in American culture and American society, and he um, thinks of it also as a visual history of the country, if you will, okay? And that's what I found, and I, I especially found it um, important to, to include th this quote from um, the previous one, from, from Taft, which I think really um, highlights this approach that is um, focused on local societies and the ways in which um, those societies engaged with photographic objects over time and how they were integrated in societies from early on, so from the 1840s and 50s onwards, um, not even until um, 1900. So it's really this embedded character that I read in Taft, which is something that I did not see in Newhall or in um, Adams's um, appreciation of photography later on and so how those 19th century photographers really enter Newhall's history is through this continuity, through this focus on the style, the straight uh, label that he there are documents of his exchanges with the F64 group um, in which he circulated an album by Timothy O'Sullivan telling his peers at F64, this is the sharp aesthetic that we want to practice and this dates back to the 1870s. And so they, these photographers from what I, from what I saw in those sources of the time were really being stripped off that embedded um, context that Taft was referring to. Thanks. I too am interested in Taft and uh, uh, your, your view of, of um, Taft's work. Um, and I think there's an important reminder about Taft is that while he may have been overlooked in later decades by um, uh, photographic historians, the book never went out of print. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's a different audience that he's yeah. directed to. There's a granularity to his work that is not, it doesn't attract the art historians, mm -hmm. or the photographic historians, and there is, as, as we just discussed, there's a focus on, on uh, the documentary, um, mm -hmm. but the other, other aspect of his, his, his perspective is that he's a chemist, mm -hmm. trained as a chemist, so he's interested also in the technology of the craft, and mm -hmm. that's, that's embedded throughout the, the work and is very powerful in it, actually. And so any, any other observations you have on Taft and why that, uh, that um, 
trajectory of his work was uh, was overlooked mm -hmm, by mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by the um, early photographic historians. Francois, did, of course, did some groundbreaking yes, work on this. Yes, so, yeah. yes. I mean, what I saw in Taft is, of course, the 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 embedded aspect. But as you said, yeah, the focus on um, technology um, that. Of course, his his history stops before the the 1900s. But what I saw in the 1900s is really this um, implementation of all those new technologies and the ways that are that they are being used by camera clubs and especially the California Camera Club that was relying on all of those different um, technologies. And what I found interesting is this simple reduction then to pictorialism because it is made to fit um, it is made to fit this uh, this narrative and I was looking for um, any sort of Taft approach in um, histories of Californian photography in the, in the 1960s when I think his book was re-edited um, but I, I couldn't find I couldn't find any um, any references um, to this. What I saw by the 1960s um, in those institutions like the Oakland Museum or the Legion of Honor, which were really small institutions, but which tried to have their holdings appreciated or reappreciated. What what they did is they really followed the model that had been. Um, imposed, if you will, or that had been circulated by MoMA. And so there was, at that point in time already, I think by the 1960s, there was no real space left for um, this, this approach, at least in what I saw. I've never seen his work being mentioned, um, not even in camera craft, I think, but I'd have to follow up on that, yeah. All right. Oh. Panama Pacific exhibition, which appears in lots of photographs. And, mm -hmm. and it's such an impossible object to photograph, that strange Shangri-La architecture. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, does, does it, it seems to, that it, the architecture had a, 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 a weird effect on the photographs. And you, you had several of them. Uh, how could you photograph it without softening the photo uh, the the uh, it's it's not not it's it's when people take the close up of the dome with the water the, in front the tower of jewels well it's just again and again it's the thing mm -hmm. that still exists mm -hmm. in San Francisco and i oh wondered, yes yes and the whole the the Panama <laughs> Pacific exhibition was partly about um San Francisco rebuilt yeah. but it was also about uh, the Philippines, yes, as and a, the canal, and the, so it's yes, a, it's a, yeah. um, it's a strange, unique moment in American uh, foreign policy and, yes, and domestic history. So, so to photograph it seems <laughs> seems a um, an invitation to fantasy and soft focus. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And this is what um, many of the photographers who were active and who were still part of that first generation of the California Camera Club were also doing. Not only did they want to show the the fairgrounds with the with their neoclassical architecture, okay, which Ansel Adams, of course, also did at age um, thirteen um, when he visited the fair. So it was, of course, an invitation to um, to carry on in this pictorialist style that on the one hand would underline um, the aesthetic quality also of, of the photographs themselves but also the um, the artistic achievement if you will of San Francisco in 1915 okay as a city that um, 65 years earlier um, had been known only for um, the the gold rush so there was this idea of um, showcasing achievement displaying um, artistic finesse, if you will, also, and um, at the same time to underline the um, strategic location of the city for the 20th century, and that is really what was celebrated at the um, at the Panama Pacific Exposition, and this is what you find, again, in the Camera Club um, documents or sources of the time. Not only do they want to um, have an aesthetic um, display at the fair, but they also want to celebrate um, California's role for the um, emerging 20th century. The, the two are very much present, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, okay. thank you for your talk. Um, I'm just curious to hear more about um, what you think of Adam's practice in the 1940s generally. Um, and it's quite strange because he, he's on the one hand documenting um, with Lang, Richmond, um, Lockheed, you know, these mm -mm. wartime factories. But at the same time, he's in Manzanar mm -hmm. at the same time or at a different time than Lang. And, you know, Lang abhors uh, his, his, his project. But, you know, at the time, Adams, um, you know, in the book, Born Free and Equal, he also is quite paranoid. He's like, okay, these books were burned by the government mm -mm -mm. When, on, upon release, right? And so they also was... You know, and so I was just curious to think, because it's a weird document of you know, both the social and the pictorial mm -hmm, that's you know, mm -hmm. featured in this project. Um, and I'm not too sure if we can dismiss this project wholeheartedly as, yeah, you know, sure, so just, sure. just curious to think, you know, hit, you know, I wonder what you, you make of Adam's practice at this particular moment in the 1940s and how this might trouble, you know the writing of history. Right? Yes, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. What I, what I recognized um, during, during my research, and Adams really closes the, the, the chronology of my research, is that when I focused on Adams's work in the 1940s, um, and when I, when I really saw his, um, not only the, the work that he did at Manzanar, but also much of the, the commercial work and the professional commissions he was doing at the time, um, I, I recognized the general practices of m my uh, t turn of the century photographers, if you will. And this really was at odds with that retrospective reputation, if you will, of Adams as this um, fine art practitioner carefully selecting his, um, his projects at the time. So I was, um, I was struck by that. Um, those the the two sides of um, of this uh, this figure who himself he, I mean he 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 forged his own narrative as a fine art photographer and carefully selected the the, the sources that would be shown and he worked on that biography with his um, with his assistant Mary Allender um, who then uses that specific language that I was referring to when he met Stieglitz and so on and so forth but then when once you enter um, really the, the the local context in which he was operating um, you see a much more um, refined um, image basically of, of, of his practice and that is something that I think he um, carefully discarded over time and that has been carefully discarded over time time and again and um, I think it's um, I think it's important to underline that um, that aspect that was much more varied of his work um, later on um, so yeah all right thank you Carolyn thank you